fine. As uh, we begin this new series together, this spiritual growth campaign called Transformed. And uh, we're going to begin uh, by looking at our spiritual health. And uh, what we're going to do over these uh, seven weeks is we're going to look at seven key areas of life. Areas where uh, we need to perhaps make changes in. Areas perhaps where we've not really thought about it. Uh, we've maybe not thought about some of these things that we're going to talk about over the next seven weeks. Uh, and really, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, as I sort of introduced the, the idea of this series, is that there is an overarching sort of verse, uh, a sort of principle verse, which is Romans 12, verse 2. This is what it says. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the idea. That's what we're going to be looking at over these next seven weeks in these seven key areas about how we might become or how we might be transformed, transformed particularly by the renewing of your mind. Because the way you think determines the way that you feel, and the way you feel determines the way that you act. If you want to change something in life that you don't like, you don't start with actions, you don't start with your feelings, you don't start with perhaps uh, sort of your will, you start with your thoughts. You see, the key to transformation in our lives is not in your actions, not in your behavior, not in your will. It starts with your thoughts, how you think about things. And if you can change the way that you think, you will change the way that you feel. And if you change the way that you feel, you will then change the way that you act. And we're going to take that principle, that Romans 12, 2 principle, and we're going to apply it, as I said, to the seven key areas of our life. We're going to look at our relational life. We're going to look at our physical life, our mental, our spiritual, our emotional, our financial and vocational life. And we're going to look at all of these say, seven major areas of life and we're going to look at that and we're going to ask the question, how do I change in those areas of my life? How do I change the way that I think about this so that I feel differently about it, these major areas of life, and then because I think and I feel differently about it, then I will change the way that I act, how I respond to situations, how I respond to other people, how I respond in these seven key areas of our life. And that is what we're going to be looking at. And that is called transformation. Transformation changes us from emptiness to fullness, from insecurity and inferiority to courage and to boldness. In other words, transformation helps us to become all that God wants us to be. Now, in the first message, we're going to begin by looking at our spiritual health. And the fact is this. The further away you get from God, the more trouble you are going to have in your life. The more difficulties, the more stress, the more challenges, the more things that can go wrong because you are not cooperating with your Creator. You're not in relationship with God. You're not following God's plan for your life. And the Bible says that the way of the unrighteous is rough. It is full of thorns. It is difficult. It is a rocky road. The further I get away from God, the more trouble I'm going to have in my life. Well, on the other hand, the closer I get to God, the more my life is going to be transformed. And we can see this all throughout Scripture. Paul, for example, when he finally met Jesus face to face on that Damascus Road experience when Jesus got hold of him, he was radically transformed. He was dramatically changed and he became the Apostle Paul. He became the Apostle of Love. In fact, he was someone who was around persecuting the church, persecuting Christians and he met Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus and he was transformed. And he became the Apostle of Love. And he wrote probably one of the greatest or most beautiful love poems in the whole of the Bible, which is 1 Corinthians 13. Isaiah, in the Old Testament, he was transformed from a depressed person into a courageous person when he met God, when he got close to God. In fact, when Moses got close to God, the Bible says he got so close to God that he was even transformed in his appearance. People had to look away from him. He, he had this glow about him. He got so close to God that he got his light, and in him is no darkness at all. He was literally, physically transformed. Now, I think we all want to be close to God. Each and every one of us has a God-shaped hole in our lives. 
And we might fill it with lots of different things. We might try to fill it with all different sorts of things. Could be good things, could be bad things. But each one of us has a God-shaped hole in our life. And until we fill it with God, we will never, ever find fulfillment. And I think we all want to be close to God. You wouldn't be here this Sunday if you didn't want to be close to God. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. In other words, like sheep, we tend to wander. You don't have to teach sheep to wander off. They just do that naturally. Uh, uh, By their very nature, they will just wander off, and the shepherd's role is to bring them back, to keep them together. Sheep aren't really that uh, bright an animal. Uh, They'll walk into a den of wolves, for example. And all kinds of difficult and dangerous situations, sheep tend to wander. And the Bible says we all, that's you and me, like sheep, have gone astray. We don't tend to stay close to God. We tend, to, we tend to wander off. So as we start this spiritual growth campaign, which is all about transformation, if I said the closer you get to God, the more you're going to be transformed, we need to talk about that, therefore. How do you get close to God? How do you stay close to God? And if you've fallen away from God, how do you get back to be close with him in a close relationship to God? In other words, how do we become all that God wants us to be? And some of you can point to a time in your life where you say, do you know what? I remember when I really felt God's presence in my life. I was close to God. I could feel him in my life. I sensed his friendship. I, I, I knew his, his fellowship. There was a joy in my life because I was close to him. But you know, I, I've lost that a little bit. How do I get back to God if I've kind of wandered away? kind of lost that spark, you know? You know, one of the wonderful things I love to see is a a new Christian, there is that spark, isn't there? That joy of being in relationship with God. And yet, what if we've lost that spark a bit this morning? Because if I'm not close to God, I don't have the power to make the kind of transformations that we're going to look at over the next seven weeks. Now, fortunately, we have a story in the Bible about how to get back to God, how to get close to the Father. It's one of those famous stories in the Bible that Jesus told. It's the stories I read earlier on. It's the story of the prodigal son. Or sometimes it's called the story of the the loving father because it's really all about the father than it is about the son wandering off. We read it earlier on in Luke 15. It tells the story of how every one of us tends to wander away from our creator, wander away from the father who has made us, wander away from God who loves us. This son, in Jesus' story, starts off saying, Father, I want you to give me what's rightfully mine. It is all about me. Give me mine. It's a very self-centered life. Did you pick that up? And that's where we usually start in life. Give me mine. Give me what I want. I want mine now. And by the way, I'm in a hurry. I want it now, uh, and if I want it now and I can't pay for it, well, I'll put it on credit uh, because I want it now. We're always in a hurry. We want stuff now. Give me mine now. So the son takes off. He packs up and he heads off for a distant land. And there he wastes his money and his time and his energy on wine, women, and song. And he really gets messed up. And he eventually hits Skid Row. And he becomes homeless. And then on top of that, the entire nation goes into a national recession because there is a famine in the land. And now nobody has anything to eat. And nobody's going to give this homeless guy anything to eat because they've not got anything to eat themselves. So they're not going to share that. He can't even find a job. Uh, he, 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 and things go from bad to worse. Finally, he gets to a farm where he sort of hires himself out to do the worst job on the farm, which is feeding and slopping out pigs. Now... For a Jew, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. That's not kosher because you're not even supposed to touch a pig if you're Jewish. You're not supposed to have anything to do with pork. And so he gets the worst job a Jewish kid could get, slopping out pigs. In fact, he gets so hungry. You see it in the text, don't you? He gets so hungry, he looks at the pig food, and he goes, wow, that looks good, this pig food. So you've got to be seriously desperate, haven't you, if you're looking at, pig slop and think, well, that looks appetizing. And it says nobody gave him anything. And then it says, and this is the key verse, 
Then it says, he came to his senses. He said to himself, you know, the servants, these are the poorest paid guys in my dad's employment. They eat better than this. What in the world am I doing? He knows he doesn't deserve his father's love. He's just wasted half of his dad's inheritance. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home. I'm going to ask my father if he'll just accept me, but not as his son. I'm going to go home and say, please, will you hire me like one of your servants? I'd rather be a servant in your house than living in a distant country, starving to death. And you know the rest of the story and the father's response. We read it earlier on. Now, from this story, we gain four things we need to do to get back to God. You may be far away from God. Or, or maybe you've been a bit distanced from God this week. You know, things have happened. Stuff comes on top of you throughout the week. And maybe you don't really feel God's presence in your life. Or it's been one of those sorts of weeks. And yet we all long to be close to God. How, how do we do that? How do we get back to him? Four things. Follow me on your outline. The first is this. The first thing I need to do is I get dissatisfied with my life. I get dissatisfied with my life. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that we, in effect, get fed up with our circumstances. In other words, I look at myself and I get fed up with the way that I'm living. I get dissatisfied with my relationship with God. I say, I'm not going to gonna live like this anymore. I am too stressed out, I'm too lonely, I'm too depressed, I'm overworked, I'm busy, and I don't even like myself. Why would anybody like me? I don't even like me, I don't like the life I'm living right now. And we get to that point where we say, there's nothing <coughs> I'm happy about. See, nothing is going to happen in your life in these next seven weeks until you first get to that point and you get dissatisfied and you say, do you know what, there are some changes I need to make. So if you think, well, I'm fine, I'm just fine, I'm okay, I just, my relationship with God is not brilliant, but I'll just, yeah, you know, it's okay, then you're not going to change. In fact, you can almost sit these next seven weeks out, because if you're thinking like that, then you're not going to change. Really, there comes a point in our life, in our spiritual lives, where we say, do you know what? There must be more in the relationship with God. And in a sense, we get dissatisfied. In a sense, we get desperate. You get hungry for more of God in your life. You get anxious for change. Look at it in Luke 15. It says this. He squandered his wealth. He spent everything. He began to be in need. He got desperate. He got hungry. He came to his senses. Do you see that? That's where the transformation began for him. And God loves you just the way that you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He will not let you waste your life. When God wants to get our attention, he comes and knocks on our door. And if we ignore it, he just knocks again on our door. And then if you ignore it, he knocks again on your door. And if we ignore it, he blows the door down. Have you found that? And some of you, because you've been ignoring God or things have happened and God has blown the door down because God won't be ignored. God does everything he does in your life out of love. Don't have this view that God is like this sort of dictator that, that brings things into your life because he wants to hurt you. No, 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 you misunderstand God's heart of love for you. But he doesn't want you to waste your life, your one and only life. <coughs> In fact, God often makes you hungry for him. He may put things and circumstances in your life so that you are realizing that actually you are quite distant from God. And when you start saying, I'm just unsatisfied with my life, I just don't like the way I'm living, I don't like this, that is God knocking on your door and saying, hey, what about me? Where are we in our relationship? See, the first step in transformation is for us to get dissatisfied. You get fed up with the way in which we're living. Jeremiah 29, 13, God says this, you will find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. God is not going to reveal himself in just sort of kind of want to do it on a casual basis. You know, it's a contradiction in terms to say that you're a casual Christian. There's no such thing as a casual Christian. You can't just add Jesus to your life because you think it's a good idea. God wants all of us. He deserves all of us because he gave all of himself to us. 
through Jesus Christ. So Christianity is not like a part-time hobby. And if you're living like that, then you will be dissatisfied. You will be missing out on all that God wants to give you. We have to get dissatisfied. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be a better way to live than this. The second step is I confess my sin. I confess my sin. First, I get dissatisfied with my life. Second, I own up to my own sin. That's the second thing that this young man did. We see this in verses 17 and 18. It says this. When he came to his senses, in fact, circle that, because that's key words in the passage here. He goes, look, he comes to his senses. He says, look, this is madness. This is just nuts. This is crazy. I can't live like this. I can't maintain this sort of lifestyle. I'm not fu- it's not fulfilling. It's not sustainable. When he came to his senses, in other words, he woke up to his situation. In other words, he was saying to himself, to live without God is insane. To live without God does not make sense. To live without God is not rational. To live without the creator who made you is illogical. It doesn't make sense. When he came to his senses, he said, I have sinned against heaven, God and you. Do you see that? He recognized that he'd sinned against God first and foremost. Nothing is going to happen until you come to stage two. Stage two is the sense of owning up to sin in your life. You confess it and you say, well, I need to face up to the fact that I've not been living God's way. I've been living my way. I've been doing the things that I think are best in my life, doing it my way, and I try to control everything around me so that it's all about how I want it to be. But my life isn't going so well, so I own up. Now, what do I own up to? Well, I own up to my sin. Notice, when he came to his senses, he said, I have sinned. Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Have you ever prayed and you felt like God was a million miles away? Have you ever prayed and felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling? Have you ever prayed and felt like there was just this sort of barrier between you and God? I can't see God, I can't hear God, I can't feel God, I feel like I'm just talking to myself. Where does that come from? It comes from sin. Because your sin has separated you from God and he's hidden his face from you. It comes from sin. You see, God loves you unconditionally. But if you feel far away from God this morning, you are the one who has moved away from him. He never moves away from you. You may have been giving your love to something else or someone else instead of God. See, when you give anything else your love, there is a word for that in the Bible. It's called an idol. We think an idol is like this sort of wooden thing or this stone thing that people sort of bow down and worship to. No, an idol is more than that. An idol can look like your car. It can look like your job. It can even look like your family. It can be maybe your appearance. It could be all sorts of things. Whatever it is that takes first place in your life before God is an idol. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5, the first and second commandments say this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. So money can be an idol. Success can be an idol. These are not bad things. They're just not deserving the first place in your life. So I own up to my sin. Your sins have separated you from God. The fact is you are as close to God as you choose to be this morning. And you can't really blame anybody else, by the way. You know, sometimes we say, do you know what? If it wasn't for them, I'd feel closer to God. Or if it wasn't for someone in my past, I'd feel closer to God. Or maybe I'm married to someone who doesn't follow the faith as I do. And if only they were, then I'd feel closer to God. No, 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 you can't blame anybody else. You're as close to God as you choose to be this morning. So when I own up and say, God, look, I've blown it. I've been going in my own way. I haven't been giving, going your way. Uh, I've, I've not been doing what you want me to do. When I do that, what is God's response to that when I'm facing up to my sin? Does he go, oh, yes, and let me tell you a few other things that's not good in your life? No, he doesn't rub it in. When I come and say, God, do you know what I've done? I'm really sorry. What does he do? He forgives us. Here's the prayer you should pray. Psalm 51. 
David prayed this prayer after he committed adultery and killed Uriah, which was Bathsheba's husband. This is a pretty serious sin. This is what uh, it says, Isaiah 51, verses 1 to 4. David says this. He says, Be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love. Because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins, wash away all my evil and make me clean. I recognize my faults and I'm conscious that I sinned against you. Circle that phrase, recognize my faults. That means to own up to my sin, to confess my sin. I own up to them. I recognize my faults. And what is God's response when I own up, when I confess my sin, when I face up to it? Look at this next verse, Isaiah 1 verse 18. The Lord says, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. He says, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've done it with, I can remove it. This is the stain remover verse in the Bible. Now, one of the ways that you can own up to sin, to keep sin at bay, is to develop the regular habit of a spiritual checkup. You're going to find in your small groups this week, you're going to look at, on the DVD teaching, you're going to look at seven habits for spiritual growth. That's what you're going to study in the small groups. But I want to give you two extra ones this morning. The first one goes with this point. It's important to have a spiritual checkup in, and to get into the regular habit of doing that. So doctors encourage us, don't they, to have a regular physical checkup. Why? Well, because there's anything untoward growing in our body. We want to know about it early, don't we? We want to deal with it early. Sooner or later, we want to sort it out. And that is true in our spiritual life. If sin starts growing in you, then it, become, it can grow worse and worse, almost like a cancer. And it's better to nip it in the bud before it gets really big. And so, therefore, it's a good idea to do a spiritual checkup on a regular basis. Now, each week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about setting a spiritual goal for our lives each week of the campaign. Now, these goals are not to be burdensome. These are not to sort of think, oh, man, I've got to set all these goals and I can't cope with them, that sort of stuff. No, no, no. They need to be goals that are attainable, goals that stretch a little bit more, but goals that you can actually set in place so that over the seven weeks or over the sort of three, four months as you sort of work them out, you're able to set these goals so that you're intentional about growing in each one of these seven areas. One of the goals for this week I would recommend to you is to get into the habit of having a spiritual checkup. If you're using the devotional book, you'll find that there's an example of using a spiritual growth checkup. It's in the back of the book. But, but it's just a good thing to get into the habit. So why not this week stop and say, where am I spiritually? Give yourself a checkup. And then get into the habit of doing it, maybe once every six months or, or, or whenever. How about getting a prayer partner and do it with them, with them? And you talk about it together and say, look, will you hold me accountable? Will you help me? Will you encourage me in this area of my spiritual life where I'm struggling? It's just a good thing to have this idea of a spiritual checkup to see where am I? Let me show you a couple of verses just so you can see how important the Bible speaks about it. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says this. Test yourself to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. If you fail the test, do something about it. I love the way the message puts that. The other versions of the Bible say the same sort of thing. It's this idea of stopping. Where am I in my spiritual life? Where am I in my relationship with God? Have I grown in the last year? Or do I, like it says here, do I drift along and just take everything for granted? Are you responsible? Are you being intentional about your spiritual growth? Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you know the Bible says also that before you take the Lord's Supper, you should do a spiritual checkup every time. Do you realize that? Most communion services, I read the same verses out. Do you know why I do that? so that we might look at our hearts. Here it is in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. It says, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In other words, he's going to God and say, is there anything in me? Is there anything in me that is wrong? Spiritual checkup. In other words, it's confessing my sin before I take the Lord's Supper. I face up to what I need to do. 
Now, each week, what we're going to do is there's going to be a memory verse, as you know. This is the week's memory verse for us to focus on. It's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Here it is. This is a great verse. It reminds us, if we're a Christian, uh, where we stand. It's a verse that talks about our position, a positional verse. This is what it says. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Why don't we say that together out loud? Here we go then. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Now, hey, now remember, you must always give the address when you do the verse, okay? Which is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Let's do it again. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And that's a great verse to memorize this week because this is what it means. If you are a Christian, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are a new person. What does that mean? It means you don't have to stay the same anymore. You now have a new power in your life. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, which gives you that power to transform, to change, to mold, to become more like Christ. You have a new ability. You have a new community. You are now part of the family of God, which is the church. You have a new identity. You are now in Christ. You are a follower of Christ. You have a new destiny. Eternity awaits you. Heaven is assured for you. This is a great verse to remind you, if you're a Christian, this is you, who you are. I encourage you this week to memorize it, to learn it. It will greatly encourage you as we go. So, I get dissatisfied with my life. Secondly, I confess my sin. Thirdly, I offer up my life. I offer up my life. In other words, I offer my total being. This is the third thing that this young man did in the story. He got dissatisfied with his life. He came to his senses and thinking, man, what on earth am I doing here? And then he owned up. He says, look, I've sinned against God. I've done things wrong. He confesses his sin. And then he offers up his life. Notice Luke 15, verse 12. It says, the younger son said to his father, father, give me my share. That's what he said. But then in verse 19, he says, make me like one of your hired men. Do you notice the change of attitude there? He leaves saying, give me, give me, give me, give me. This is what I want. He comes back saying, make me. Change me. That is transformation. True transformation happens when your heart moves from self-centeredness to all about me to God-centeredness. Lord, it's all about you. That is transformation. Are you there? Are you there yet? Or are you still, Lord, give me. God, please give me what I need. God, please will you do this for me now. God, will you please fix this, do that, sort this, give me stuff now. Or are you at the point where you say, Lord, please will you make me your servant. Lord, please will you change me. Lord, will you please mould me. That is transformation, heart transformation, from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. Are you letting God do that in you? Will you let God do that in you over these next seven weeks? See, that transformation, by the way, doesn't happen overnight. It will take your entire life as God works in you and molds you and changes you. It's never an instant thing, but there is but there is a decision that starts the process. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says this, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed. And that is a continual process. That's what the idea of the text is saying. We are being transformed. Not a one-off basis, a one-time only moment. It is a process. Are being transformed into his likeness with an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And that word transformed in the Greek, the New Testament, was originally written in the Greek language, New Testament Greek. It means metamorphosis. What is that? Well, it's when a butterfly goes from a caterpillar to a chrysalis into a butterfly. But it doesn't happen overnight, does it? In fact, there's this stage where it's sitting there in that chrysalis and it, and it forms a little cocoon and it's pretty ugly. It doesn't look very beautiful at all. But when it breaks out, the butterfly is stunning. 
That is what transformation is all about. It is this change in this metamorphosis that takes place. God, you see, made you and I to reflect his glory. But you have to go through this ongoing, transforming process. And it's a process, but the starting point is what the prodigal son says. He says, make me. That's the offer up. Make me, Lord. Transform me. Change me, God. Do a work inside of me. I don't want to live my life the way that I've been living it, doing my own thing. Lord, will you mold me, change me, transform me? You know, Romans 12, 2 is our theme verse over these next seven weeks. But let me read you the verse before it because it's really interesting. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, and only then, will you be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Notice there's no transformation until you do the offering up part. And it's important to notice the father's response, by the way, in the, in the story. Luke 15, 20 says, Filled with compassion, he ran out to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. Bring the best, he said. Bring the best robe. Bring the best ring. Bring the best shoes. Bring the fatted calf. Let's kill it. All these things. And, and notice the father didn't wait for the son to get all the way home. When he was a long way off, the father's looking. The father's waiting, watching, looking, day after day after day, looking for his son. And the moment he sees him, he runs out to him. That would not happen in that society. A, a man like this man, this father, who was wealthy, who was probably had a high regard in the community, he would never run. Literally, he would sort of, sort of hitch up his clothes, really, sort of stuff. And he would run. That would never happen. Ever happen. And yet he does that. He, he comes after him and he runs to his son and he will meet you more than halfway. And he runs out, he takes the initiative and he throws his arms around the son and he kisses him and he welcomes him back home. And God will do that with you. God will meet you more than halfway. God will pursue you. He will take the initiative because he wants you close to him. And then he will celebrate with you when you come home. And he says, I, I know that you blew it. I, I know, but let's get the best robe. Let's get the best clothes in the house. Get my ring. In fact, his signet ring. Do you know why the father says that? Because back then, the signet ring was like a credit card. The signet ring, what you do is you press it in some wax, and it will be this idea that says that it would be the credit there, that this is, because this guy has put this there, or, or, uh, has put it in, in wax, then you know that he's good for the money. And he says, give him that ring. And remember, the son had just blown all or half of his inheritance. And yet he says, here, here is unlimited credit for you. In other words, God doesn't hold a grudge about all the stupid stuff we've done in our life. When you come to him, he's ready to lavishly pour out grace and forgiveness and love on you. Bring the best. You see, God has a better plan for your life than you can ever imagine. Now, I don't know where you stand. Maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. Maybe you've come to the Transform Spiritual Growth Campaign because you're interested. You think, well, what's it all about? Or someone's invited you and you think, well, all right, I'll come, I guess. You know, that sort of stuff. Where do you stand in this whole thing? You see, I've been a Christian now for 38 years now. And every single day is an adventure with God. It doesn't mean to say that every single day is sort of, you know, bells and whistles, because there is the routine of life. But I could not do life without God. He just transforms it. And Jesus loves you so much. If you ever wonder how much God loves you, he sent his son Jesus to die for you in your place. That's how much you are loved. God, in other words, goes the extra mile. When we were in rebellion, when we had turned away from God, God says, I'll meet you more than halfway. In fact, I'll come all the way down and I'll come down in the form of my son, Jesus Christ, and I will die for you, but I will rise again, conquering death, so that the way is open to me, the Father. And he does that for you because he loves you. 
He wants you to be in relationship with him. He wants you to come home. And if you're a Christian, let me ask you, are you really living for him? Or is God just someone that you've just added on to your life, you know? You're living that half-hearted, casual Christian life that, yeah, it's okay, but you just are missing out on all that God wants to give to you. How sad would it be when you get to the end of your life and you look back and think, if only I'd lived a closer, in a closer relationship with God the Father. Yes, you will be accepted in heaven. Yes, that awaits you. But you've missed out on so much of what God wants to do and can do in and through you in your life here on earth. So if you knew there was a better way to live than the way you've been living, wouldn't you want to know about it? I mean, we live in a world where people say, well, you know, I do live a good life. Well, yes, you do. We live in Britain. And actually, life is pretty good for many people. There aren't many challenges, I guess. But the Christian life is a better life than the good life. A life of fulfillment. A life in relationship with God the Father. How do I get back to God? I get dissatisfied. I get confess. I, I offer up. But there's one more thing I do. I lift up my praise. I lift up my praise. You see, because once I come back home, I get enwrapped in God's love. He hugs me. He kisses me. And he says, bring out the best. In other words, all is forgiven. And in that celebration, you now come home, not to condemnation. You come back to God in celebration. And I just say, thank you, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. And I lift up my praise in response to that. Luke 15, here's what the Father says, verses 23 and 24. Let's have a feast and celebrate. The son is back. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Life, you see, becomes a celebration when, it, when life comes to transformation. The Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 4, Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him. His name is the Lord. Now, here's the thing. For your transformation, you need to sing in church. Now, we sing pretty well as a church, I have to be honest. And I don't know about how you were feeling this morning, but uh, may, I'll put, let, me, let me tell you. Sometimes, see, it's quite nice maybe for you guys, because... Um, if you're like feeling a bit down or you think, well, I'm just going to do church, so you come and you just do church. I don't get that option as pastor. Believe it or not, there are some Sundays where I come and I think I'm closer to God or I'm more fired up than what I am some Sundays because I am a human being and I have the same emotions as you do. But one of the things that it does do, so I felt a little bit like that this morning, actually, until we start to, sang, to sing earlier on. And I don't know about how you felt this morning, but singing a couple of those worship songs at the beginning lifts your soul, does it not? And actually, never downplay the joy of corporate worship, of singing together, and we sing to God, but we sing to one another. I don't know if you realise that. But as we worship God, we praise him for who he is, but then we minister, we share with one another, we sing, as it were, to each other. Now, some of you say, well, I can't sing. You know, some of you are prison singers. You're, you're always behind a few bars, and, uh, and uh, you never have the right key. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't say, make a tuneful noise. You don't have to be on key. You just need to worship. Now, I was reading this week, uh, looking at some of the stuff for this message, and um, in a recent scientific study, it says, Swedish researchers, they concluded that the habit of group singing, not singing by yourself, but the habit of singing in a group is good for your health. It's good for your mental health, your emotional health, it's good for your social health, it's good for your physical health. All these different areas that we're going to be looking at, incidentally, they did this extensive study, and they discovered that singing with other people lowers your blood pressure. It's good for some of us. 
releases endorphins, so that's, that makes you feel good, you know what endorphins are, it improves your mood, it builds your confidence, it relieves loneliness, it releases negative emotions and stress and creates positive emotions. So that's pretty good, isn't it? And also in this research, it also showed that if you sing worship each week, you live longer. So I want you to live longer, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do something good for your health right now. You're going to live a little bit longer after you've done this. That's not a bad thing, is it, to come to church for? We're going to sing. Now, I told you we're going to develop two new habits. You can look at seven of them over the weeks. But the habit, remember, of a regular spiritual checkup, here's the other habit. I want you to intentionally sing when you come to church. Now, it does not matter if you don't know the songs or you don't like the songs or you don't like the way it's played or the things like that, or it's too loud, too quiet, it's not your style. It really doesn't matter. I think we get a decent fusion of different styles here, incidentally. But I want you to sing. If you've got blood pressure, hey, I bet you'll be low. You should check yourself before you come in on one of those things and then check yourself on the way out. But, you know, it will lower your blood pressure, release endorphins, improve your mood. We celebrate. We get transformed. The father celebrated. And it's interesting that he celebrated when the son came back. He wasn't condemned. He was celebrated the fact that the son had returned. Look at this verse, Psalm 13, verse 6. I will sing to the Lord. Why? Because he has been so good to me. So we're going to do that. Let's stand, shall we? And we celebrate and we can live a bit longer as we sing together. My Saviour, Redeemer, lifted me from fiery clay. Almighty, forever. I will never be the same because you came. we are overwhelmed and it makes our heart want to sing and Lord we recognize that there is no way we deserve this kind of celebration this kind of welcome when we come home because we have rebelled against you but Father we thank you that you meet us more than halfway and we come to you and first we say Lord we are dissatisfied with the way in which we've been living we're fed up with living a life without Christ, or we're fed up, Lord, because we don't feel close to you. We're fed up with doing it all in our own power. And Lord, we own up, we, we confess, we, we realize that we have sinned against you. And we realize that you haven't moved, but we have. And the reason we're not close is because we've allowed other things to cloud our vision of you. We've put something else as number one in our lives instead of you. We've allowed idols in our life. We have loved other things more than you. And that has made you feel distant from us. But Lord, we thank you that you never move away from us. And so we come back and we, we own up to our sin. And then, Lord, we offer up ourselves. We're no longer saying, give me. We're saying, please make me, change me, transform me. And Lord, our prayer would be is that you would transform our lives during these 50 days. That we would never be the same again because we've met with you and you've done that transforming work of grace in our hearts and in our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.